If you're watching this video on the day it was released, Apple is currently worth well over a trillion dollars. The number last time I checked is actually something like 1.35 trillion and about 207 billion of that is available to the company as pure liquid cash. Now that's, that's a stupid amount of money, but Apple wasn't always quite this well off. In fact, about this time last year, things were kind of bad actually iPhone sales had tanked mostly because customers in China did not want them, which led Tim Cook to make the rare, difficult decision to dial down Apple's quarterly revenue guidance by about $5 billion. The end result, Apple's balance sheet and its stock price at the time were pretty dismal, at least by its own usual corporate mega titan standards. I bring all of this up not because I particularly want to talk about money, but because of what that money says about Apple's shifting priorities as a company. Almost since the day it was released, Apple has been an entity that lives or dies by the success of the iPhone. And the blockbuster quarter this company just had is proof. After last year's totally fine, but like not super amazing iPhone XS series, people really flocked to the 11 and the 11 Pros. That's why they paid billions more for them. Even so, last year's rough sales were a clear reminder that it doesn't just not hurt to diversify as a company, it is essential. That is why Apple is pushing so hard to grow the services part of its business, which this quarter generated an all-time record of $12.7 billion. Historically, that is the business segment where Apple tallies up its app store revenue, its iCloud and Apple Music subscriptions and stuff like Apple Care, and it's these kinds of prosaic things where the company recently saw those record results. Now though, we also have flashy stuff like Apple News Plus, Apple Arcade, the Apple Card, Apple TV Plus, with the nominations that I just got for the morning show. These are all potentially valuable contributors to Apple's bottom line that just launched last year. It's obviously a bit early to really say what kind of impact they're having, but if you ever wanted to see a company try to redefine itself in real time, be sure to watch Apple this year. Like I said earlier though, Apple is in fact a company that lives and dies by the iPhone. And say what you will, the company makes a solid smartphone. What Apple realized years back though with the Apple Watch and more recently with products like the AirPods though, is that serious growth is possible when you sweeten that ecosystem around the iPhone. The Apple Watch Series 5 was kind of a surprise. I don't think a lot of us saw Apple releasing it last year as a possibility, but it did and I really like it. Its biggest value might lay in the fact that it drove the Series 3 watch's price down to $199. The AirPods Pro were less of a surprise, but it also was a great upgrade that made the original AirPods feel a little more accessible by comparison. It, I guess, also didn't hurt that AirPods very quickly became this weird kind of status symbol too. In any case, I know quite a few people who weren't particularly swayed by the iPhones on their own, but who bought them anyway because they wanted to use what is, I think objectively, the best smartwatch out there, or because they like the idea of these frustration-free AirPods. That's obviously anecdotal evidence, but whatever, it's still pretty clear that Apple doesn't just wanna sell iPhones, it wants to sell a lifestyle around these iPhones. And based on the numbers we're seeing right now, it's doing a pretty good job. Well, in most places anyway. Remember when I said Apple ate it last year because people in China didn't buy as many iPhones as the company expected? Well, China didn't do much for Apple this time either. I mean, that's all in relative terms. It accounted for $13.28 billion of Apple's overall revenue, up from about $13.17 billion this time last year. That's obviously still a lot of money, but quite a bit less than the nearly $18 billion China made for Apple in early 2018. Tim Cook said on Apple's earning call that well, you can listen to him. For the results from last quarter, uh, we had double digit growth for iPhone in mainland China. We also had double digit growth in services in mainland China. And we had extremely strong double digit on wearables. Uh, iPhone 11 is doing particularly well there. The product has been very well received with its battery life and the, the camera is, is unbelievable. We're attracting quite the uh, quite a, a large percentage of new customers on on products like the Mac. Three quarters of the customers buying a Mac uh, in China are new, and nearly two thirds of the customers buying iPad are new. And so, it was a terrific quarter. That was a lot of words that didn't really shed a whole light on why Apple didn't do better in China this time around, but. 
I don't know, a terrific quarter? Sure, Tim. I mean, we've seen more terrific ones before, but that's fine. Meanwhile, growing concerns over the widespread coronavirus outbreak led some of us to wonder whether the Chinese economy, and particularly the manufacturing sector where Apple really clearly plays, would feel the pinch while the world kind of collectively freaked out. For what it's worth, it doesn't look like Apple should be impacted. Foxconn, one of its main manufacturing partners, says its production timelines won't be affected as a result of the outbreak. So yeah, long story short, Apple made an even more ungodly amount of money than usual this time, and for the most part, it made it off the products you'd expect. This is the year though, when we might start to see the balances between that core iPhone business and everything else shift in different ways. And the same might be true of the different locales where Apple operates. So if you wanna keep up on the latest, be sure to subscribe and keep on watching us on Engadget.